Hello, Dream Team. Welcome along to the 2023 Six Nations preview. It's a World Cup year. It feels like the stakes have been raised. There is a lot riding on the next few weeks, and we have got some legends of the game alongside to look at all that is to come. Borthwick and Gatland back just in time. Will they make the difference? We shall discuss. And luckily this week, it is not just Haskentins. Welcome to both of you. Both of you. Nevertheless, we've got a little bit of help alongside. The dear Fox is up from Weirs. How are you? Very well, thank you. You made nosebleed. Nosebleed when you walked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I came out of a rash when I got off the train. Did you? Yeah. Looking good on it. You you meant to be on holiday this week. Where were you meant to be? Uh, we were looking at going to Bacala, which is Mexico. You travel hard. Wait, he's been on holiday a lot yes. recently. <laughs> well, how many places have you been to recently? Uh, There's a lot. Canada. Palmer, Palmer yeah. um, Copenhagen, Miami. I, you know, take advantage when you've got time off. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching a, do uh, a documentary on extreme travellers. Maybe that could be your new thing, post-career. Yeah, I could reboot Wish You Were Here, I reckon. I'll do that <laughs> one, is it? I, I, I get involved in that. Have yeah. you ever seen that place in the sun where you can get a house in Spain for like 50 grand? Welcome along to our Six Nations preview. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us. Thankfully, Jordan Murphy is alongside as well to bring a bit of class to proceedings. I'm going to read this. Is, I didn't realise all of this. Oh, quite a bit of it. Oh, Shush, <laughs> Hask. The most decorated player in Premiership history with eight titles. Seven more than yeah. you. Uh, two Heineken Cups. 2009 Six Nations Grand Slam, seven appearances to the Lions and 72 caps for his country. Former Leicester coach and director of rugby. And interestingly, can you remember what you were doing last time you were on the show? No. Apparently you were in hospital because you were about to welcome a new baby. Ah, that's true. I'd completely forgotten Do that. You were just saying it, uh, three days older than Lucas. Is that right? Yeah, was I in hospital or was I on the way to hospital? Were you on the way to hospital? On the way to hospital was even more professional. Yeah. <laughs> what, oh, we love, keep it down, keep the screams down, breathe, no, breathe, I, breathe. I, breathe. I, I oh, think their surge is not contractions. Drive, down. drive in as well. Yeah. All all right? All good, little girl. Good. Was born a couple of days later and they... Um, good. good. Right. Quick show this week. Short, sharp. Firm opinions. Away we go. We're going to work our way up from the bottom to the top of last year's table, Italy, Wales, Scotland, England, Ireland, France, to try and nail down what we think will be happening, what we should be watching out for, uh, and sort of trends and, I suppose, ideas about what might well happen over the next six weeks of action. So we're going to start with the big dogs of Italy, sixth in last year's Six Nations, head coach Kieran Crowley, former All Black, of course, captain Michele Lamoro, and the ones to watch that we've picked out, Ange Capuzzo and Eduardo Padovani, 12th in the world right now, Lord, would you like to lead us off? Is this the year that Italy fire some big old shots uh, or is the gap still a little um, difficult? No, I, I generally think the gap has closed a little bit. The problem is, is the nuts and bolts I've, I've said for Italy for the last two years. I think they've got attacking threats through the team. Obviously, we saw that last minute try uh, to down Wales. Uh, Foxy was very, very quick to say that he wasn't playing in that yeah. game. Nor the Georgia one as well, no. actually. We, yeah. should, we should stipulate <laughs> that as well. Back, yeah. uh, Just then, stating facts. You know, and I think they have the ability to score tries. I think that they are leaky in terms of... I think that they're risking it all, is what I would say. They're playing from deep. They, they could do with just managing the game a bit better, but... They're sticking to their brand and how they want to try and play, and I, I sort of support that. I think they're fun to watch. Uh, they obviously beat Samoa in the autumn, and they beat uh, they beat Australia. Um, so, you know, then they got hammered by South Africa. But I think uh, they are 12th in the world, so you can't expect them to really go out there and, and win games. So they're going to try and... I think what they've done is try and spice it up with what the type of rugby that they play and at least make games entertaining. Um, now... You know, they got their first win in, what, seven years last year against Wales. Their job is to go and get two, maybe. Yeah, I, I think that's the important thing to remember, is in this time last year, people were campaigning for them to be kicked out of the Six Nations. Yeah. And it was actually a genuine debate on whether or not, you know, them losing consistently was, was going to be good enough. Uh, and I think, you know, that win against Wales... Sorry, Fox. <laughs> I um, wasn't playing. I yeah. wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was enough almost for people to say, actually, hold on, they have got something to offer. Um, you know, I don't think they'll finish any higher than last place again this year. Really? Um, but, well, but what we're saying is, you know... They can go out and they can win a game on their day. Um, and I think the gap is closing and they are getting more competitive. Um, they, have, they have been great for the Six Nations. Everyone loves a trip to Rome. All the players, all the, all the supporters love a trip to Rome. And, and I think that's a great thing. Um, the gap is closing, but it's, is it quick enough? Um, for me, no. Um, again, I, I don't think they have the, the players to manage a game. So, you know, they can, if they're in a game 60, 70 minutes, they can be competitive and they can pull something out of nothing. But how often are they in Six Nations games with 60, 70 minutes? It's, it's, it's pretty rare, so I expect them to be last again. Yeah. That win against Wales. 
which I wasn't playing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we just can we just can we just confirm you weren't playing? In I that was game? not playing yeah. against Italy okay. last but, season. But that but that win against Wales. I mean, did, did get, and I suppose if you couple that with, I mean, they went well against Samoa. They snuck a a, a tight one against Australia, and then they got battered against. Uh, South Africa. I mean, it's still a little bit up and down. It fluctuates quite a bit. But are you seeing, or where are you seeing genuine progress? I think you're seeing growth in their performances. And I think what might go against them is that they've gained more respect from the other countries. And they might be uh, more attention to detail when they go up against them and realize that they, you know, they do pose threats. And um, instead of thinking, being like, right, it's just about us this week. We're playing Italy. If we worry about ourselves, or we'll get the result. But you have to give them. They have credible, genuine threats with ball in hand, and you you got to pay them a bit of respect. So I think they they're going to get more attention, which might be to their detriment, really. I'm right in saying that the England Italy game was was it, what was it called? The fox. What was that? What was that tactic where you basically look utterly clueless into the ref cam? No, I what do, is I, it I'm trying no, to do? I'm not having that shit. I, I've well, explained so it a well, million you, you, you times. You can explain it, but you still look no, clueless no, into I the know, referees. I know it's because oh, that was his look. No, yeah. what's my look anyway? What well, is I, it I, I meant to be doing, okay, so, No, no, it's, no. I asked what a breakdown, what he, what he meant by breakdown. breakdown. Which Purely because, meant to be right, first of all, when you deal with international referees, and this goes to any of the fans out there, is that we have meetings upon meetings upon referees, Don't get right? Cross no, no, it. but it's important they know this. Okay. We actually have meetings upon meetings on referees, and we analyse what the referee does. So when a team has, say, Nigel Owens, when he was refereeing, and he, and he you know, cards you on loads of things, and there are stuff that you knew he was going to do, that's shame on you as a team. You're like, you knew Nigel was going to do that. Why'd you play into it? Only di difficulty is when you do analysis of a referee and you say he always favours the attacking side and he suddenly starts giving penalties away against the attacking side for doing the same thing he was rewarding the last eight games, that's when you lose the plot. When Italy did that at the breakdown, right, no one had ever seen it before. The referee had never said, fuck you, Alex. Can someone, <laughs> can someone get a net? Because no, no, I think we've got no, a bite. No, you have got a big bite, right? I want to clear <laughs> up. I want to clear up. I'll tell you why. Keep whoever's, going, whoever's in charge of the, the uh, yeah. Six Nation social media, Every time this year, just puts that video up and people go, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? And then running, and then Owen no, kicking the ball. That's pretty accurate. Bucket, it, uh, fuck off, you've right? You've gone red. You're puce. I, calm. Oi, I can't breathe. Just my, oh, fucking you, you right. Anyway, like, let me finish. You look like your dad after a few oi, beat let me, <laughs> oi, let me land. Let me land, yeah? Let me land. I basically, um, I asked the referee, because when you do the analysis, the referee says in his own words, I, I want to see good pictures. I want to see good pictures. Mm. So I asked him, what does he want to see? What did he see as a breakdown? And he's like, I'm not your referee. I'm not your uh, coach. I'm the referee. And I was like, well, I wanted to say, listen, man, I'm not a fucking referee, but I do a better job than you. Mm. You can't do that because you get yellow cards. You can't be rude to them. It's the first time <coughs> I've seen Hask ask to land. Normally he's saying, please let me fly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was just to, to, to sort of support him. The cheeky thing about that, is Ugo knew about it before yes. the game because Connor had prepped him. You, Connor has to have that com conversation with the referee. So the referee knows it's coming. So he already knows he's done his study on what the law is and how, how he's got to allow it to play. But it's it's cheeky because then obviously you don't pass that on to the opposition when really if you're going to do it you should yeah they were you know you still could have caught them out if you if they haven't prepared properly but, but also catch us out and then go what 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 I don't understand what is it you're refereeing here because we'd never seen it before like no. you're you know no, right, you people go. aren't bound on it was it was very slow to pick up on it line. but I didn't see all the coaches you know all the coaches in the in the box you know were very quiet about <laughs> what was going on <laughs> you know what I mean you know I don't know who was it who was coaching at the time player power though, it's John O'Lancaster no, it was Eddie it was Eddie he came down afterwards and he said. Oh, you don't like that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Go against the old right, golden no, no, one. No, no, fine. Eddie, fuck you, Eddie. You know, now you're in <laughs> Australia. Never liked you anyway, traitorous <laughs> bastard. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, look, the, uh, my point about that was is that I was trying to ask the right question. Italy have gone from needing to do stuff like that to actually a real credible side. And I think that's the difference now. They're playing exciting rugby, uh, whereas before you could never fault their passion. And I think it's very hard for a lot of the Italian players, because sometimes they've been seen as the laughing stock at times. You know, what Geordi said is right. You know, there was a debate whether you should put them in and Georgia. I think people are very disrespectful of Italy. When actually now they're credible across the line. They're playing some incredible rugby. They've got some players that can unlock defences. They've got some forwards, you know, with Pledgery coming back in. Um, you know, they've got some really good guys that can make do some damage. And I think they're much more consistent. Now, do they have the ability to last the whole game? I'm not sure. Are they going out on their sword? you know, die on their shield. Yeah, 100%. Is it good for the Six Nations? Absolutely. Am I excited when I see Italy play? Yeah, and I think now they've got the ability to match. Instead of having like a, a, a talismanic talent talent like Sergio Parise, and he was the only one, or yeah. Bergamasco or, or whatever. Castro. Castro. They've now got 
you know, eight or nine, you know, players like that that can really, really build a game. And, I, and I'm very excited. And I'd, I'd, it would be a shame if they do finish bottom because I'd rather watch them play than some of the teams play. You've made a very good point, actually, James, which is a rarity when we're talking about rugby. But you actually, the squad for Italy, you can pick out some proper players in there now. Lamoro, Negri, I'm going to chuck in Paledri. You're looking at Fischetti. Garbisi, Capuzzo, Garbisi. Garbisi. Yeah. So pick us one then that you are really excited about seeing. Well, for me, I said I said Garbisi. I think you know he he, you know him pulling the strings. I think when he goes well, he plays with a confidence. He plays with a passion. You know, you saw when he got the games against Australia, when he got the games against Wales, just really wears it. Now before their emotion was disruptive, doing stupid stuff at the breakdown, causing penalty plays at the, at the odd times, fly, flying into the side. They they used to be disruptive. Now their quality, now their passion's focused in the right direction because they've got good players around them. And he epitomises that for me. And I think Italy are credible. Jordi? I like the back row boys when they play well. Um, I like Garbisi. I think he's, he's obviously a very young guy and, and he's actually come on a lot in the last years. But back rows Negri, Paledri, I think they've got some real firepower to carry there. And, and that's what they need to do in, in order to win these big games. You know, they need yeah. to get go-forward ball. Tins? Yeah, no, I, I think there's there's a there's quality in the back line as well. Obviously, we talked about Capizzo and, and then uh, Padovani. Um, but then you've got the, like the more established ones like Marese, uh, Marese. Obviously, my man crush of um, Zanon's not in there. Is he injured? Um, but there you he go. Must be injured because he's um, he was next level. He was, he was. He was. He's been fantastic when they haven't had players. Now they've got players. He's he's not around. But uh, but you've got uh, Tommaso Allen. You've got people who we know as well from from the Premiership. So um, I think there's there's enough in there. Now again, we're talking as Jordan just said. We're to, we're not. We're not expecting anything of them, but as long as they go out there and try and entertain, I think that's what they've got to do and make the games entertaining whilst not getting hammered. I think uh, Brex is the thirteen who plays a lot for them. Like he's, he does a lot of good work in defence, and he's he's like a bit like the glue with their back line. I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of the moves go through him, and he he seems to facilitate like the talent he has around him. To a bit like when you used to play for Wales, wasn't it? You were described as the glue. <laughs> Something that would be missing scrum cap as well. Yeah. Yeah. Did you wear a scrum cap? He was the glue, yeah. dynamic leader in defence, add a bit of attacking flair. Yeah. Warren, you listen. We'll <laughs> <laughs> clip this up and send it over. Decided to give Wales it up. Online. For, uh, Wales Online. <laughs> Decided to give Dr. it up Davis for writing Warren holiday pieces. Error. Were you at Wasps with Minotzi? No. Was Minotzi at Wasps? Yes. yes. He was, was, yes, he yeah. wasn't, but he left by then. Um, so we're all, all comfortable that Italy coming, making great yes. progress, but not going to necessarily get off sixth. No, I, I've got a bit more confidence than that. I have confidence in that. I think they do, yeah. I think. Who are they going to beat? I think that, yeah. They're going to beat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask him to back it up or substantiate Oi. it. Just let him throw yeah. out wild claims. Uh, do you know what? I, I, not, enough, not enough people like me anyway. I don't need to be hated anymore, but, you know... <laughs> With, you know, not a million miles away from where I'm sitting, that's, they might get beaten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so got, people, people have, that misrepresent they've Jordan's. got Wales in Italy, in so Rome, they'll yeah. they'll be targeting that. Uh, I'm not sure where they're playing Scotland. Yeah. Um. Are they, no, they're, Scotland's at, uh, at Murrayfield, so um, they'll probably just be targeting that Wales. But then, I think they'll they'll go and try and put their their stamp, and they'll try and play fast tempo. They try to play offload. Sometimes it doesn't work for them. I think if Garbisi and uh, Varney can manage the game better manage their exits that's where they've been poor o over sort of the last year is is that you know the simplicity of exits you've got to get that right if they can do that and then they can get that that att attacky flare offloading game then who knows oh and i'm djing at half time england versus italy mm. at twickenham oh. so if anything is destined for me to cause some real negativity and blow the whole place up and for everything to go horrifically wrong you know that i'll be the game where i dj where england lost to ireland <laughs> i mean uh, england lost to italy that'll be the next thing God help us Hask all. Haskell, Haskell to blame. Yeah, Haskell, Haskell to blame for England shambles. He played a more, ever he played lost more. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wales, fifth in losses, six nations, ranked ninth in the world. Welcome back, Warren Gatland, on another bumper deal. Wayne Pivak has vacated the hot seat. Uh, interestingly, this week, Gats has had a lot to say about the Netflix deal. He's worried about players and coaches suffering reputational damage in quest for drama, according to Telegraph. What goes on in the Wales team with Gatland at the helm? Is that are we allowed to confer any of this? Oh look, I, I have heard nothing about this Netflix documentary. Right. I know there, there's something recorded. So there are cameras in every team, yeah. following every move, with the idea that they're going to, you know, like drive to survive and yeah. break point. You're not looking very convinced my, by yeah, it. Yeah, but my question would be: Have any of any of those documentaries has anyone come out of it horrendously badly, or do they not show people in the best light? Uh, the Pep 
Pep documentary came across as you know he screams and shouts yeah i think all the bosses from f1 have come across anyone's watched Breakpoint. i think it's a little bit different when you're man city though as in i know for <laughs> a fact when, when i was in charge at leicester there was a lot of documentary crews circling around when we were under the pump going yeah we'd really like to stick some cameras in the corners here yeah. and it was the type <laughs> of thing that was going actually seats. you know what things are going particularly badly i'm not sure they can get much worse but if you stick some cameras in the corner i'm pretty sure it's going to pick up some pretty negative things right um so so I, do I, you I, I, but do you no, empathise no, with Warren then? Massively <sighs> so. So I, saying, I don't think he's obviously agreed this Netflix deal yeah. and then he's been told, right, we need the money. We're going to bang a load of cameras in the, in the corner and just act naturally. Right. And as you well know, it's not always that easy when you stick cameras in front of your face 24-7. It can be difficult. I'm sure he wants to have conversations. He's going to have to have some really, really tough conversations. He needs to change things really, really quickly. Obviously, he's got a huge amount of respect across the world of rugby, but he's coming back into a really damaged place, is my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a huge expectation in Wales. And the club rugby hasn't been fantastic. I know there's, a, there's, there's some great players who, who, he, who he can bring in. But um, from my point of view, I wouldn't want to have those conversations with cameras all over and, and, and being but in that situation. I would say, I would say on this, I, I don't think it's not there for. There's no ca There's no cash. We all we all know that you know the first season of any of exposure of these, play. It's an it? exposure play for rugby. So the exposure is not to make rugby look stupid. That that can't be what Netflix is is there for. It's there. Six Nations wouldn't have done it if it wasn't to drive. Awareness of actually how much hard work the boys put in, what what the pressures are like at Six Nations. Test match rugby is about winning fundamentally, so there are going to be tough conversations. But it's how, it comes down to how they edit it, and I don't believe that the Six Nations would have signed a, to a deal where they're going to go in and <laughs> every time someone's getting berated or someone's bollock bollocking someone, it's going to be shown. It's going to be more about the individuals, the players, actually awareness of those players and the positivity around how much people work, what their personal backgrounds are. But equally, if you're a producer and you've got England versus or so Ireland Wales very first game and for by chance Ireland win the game, last minute drop goal, there's devastation, there's disappointment, there's upset in that Welsh changing room. Do you want that shown? Because they're not going to go, oh, this is fantastic stuff. We're not going to show it. Like, do, do does uh, he have any control over what's shown? Yeah, uh, I don't. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't assume know. six. I assume six know. nations will. So they'll still get the. Uh, they'll get the the final say on. I don't know. But I'm not they, sure. I, would, I, I think. Guys. I think you. I think guys, Netflix get, get the eight, right eight, of. We talk was, about this is oh, the Netflix thing, and their documentaries. Well, no, we, no, we talk about this though all the time about how do we grow the game? How do we showcase what yeah, we are? Got to be brave. To showcase how much yeah, the, the boys is, hurt. I think as well. Bear in mind, a lot of people in rugby are ne are not used to this level of production of scrutiny of intimacy and someone like Warren Gatton and all his coaching would never have experienced anything like this. Well, Lions documentaries. No, no they are, but, but even they then do get sign off. They, they do get sign off. It's quite controlled. I actually think this is the best thing for rugby. I do think it's going to probably have some negativity. I, I, I think what's going to happen is, for example, say Warren, you know, or any of the coaches gets caught having it dressing down a player or players doing something inappropriate or whatever and goes, I don't want to show that. Stop filming, stop filming. It's like mm, you, you can't. And I think that will be the interesting point because actually with a lot of these footballers, they're used to kind of scrutiny. A lot of these teams have cameras in the change rooms. A lot of these teams have that level of scrutiny. Rugby players have never done anything like this. Rugby's never had... Most of the content rugby teams and companies produce is pretty awful. So I think this will be a very interesting thing for, for them. And I think Gats and these guys are going to have to learn pretty quickly that this yeah. is the way the world works now and that you can't, you can't protect it. You've got to be on And I think a bit of jeopardy, a bit of emotion. I think, unfortunately, it's always sad that you have to be the first cab off the rank, as this Six Nations will be. But two or three years down the line, I think yeah. this will be commonplace. Yeah, but I, as well, I think Gats is he's an old-school coach. Yeah. He's an old-school rugby man who would rather do things his way. Foxy, you, you know yeah. him better than anyone. You're probably best yeah. to comment on it. I, th I think what, like... Just reading here now, the, the quest for drama. What what Gats, Gats might be alluding to is what that there was the huge allegations that came out at the start of the Six Nations campaign last week, and that is what's the narrative of this Netflix documentary. I think they say right, Welsh rugby are in turmoil, um, all these serious allegations or whatnot, or is it concentrated on the rugby and what the boys actually do in their in their working week and their prep for Test match rugby? So it. it I think that might be his concern of, and if Gats doesn't have control on it, he might be worried about that. Because well, I think it would be much more about the yeah. players. Because look, what sells, what fans want to know about, from far as I can see, is 
what you know what do the players do what is the emotion what's the interaction what are players actually like what are they what are they doing in the week that yeah, we don't know about what are I don't their characters think, you know, like what are yeah. their background stories what you know what makes your favorite players tick I just think what I just don't think what rugby will, will be used to or these coaches will be used to George's right those old school mentality is having intrusive stuff that you then don't control because the cameras are always rolling now look there is no benefit in Netflix blowing up the whole thing because they don't do it on any other show but will they show you know, a coach shouting at a player, yes. Will they show the emotion of a player coming and kicking a ball, 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 ball and having a fucking round? Of course they will, because that's that's life. I think in terms of where they delve into stuff, you know, things like all that other stuff, that's a murky legal thing you can't even delve into, do you know what I mean? And so you, you sort of want to shy away pretty and heavily. And it's got nothing to do with the, the competition no. that it is. That's something behind that no, I just think it'll the be players interesting have a say over or control over. I just think it'd be surprising when you see the way dress you know people could get dressed down or the analysis in, in the week or something like say for example sean was you know sean's gonna be with france you know kicking you know kicking tables over. no it doesn't all the time but like kicking the tables over and going a black out you know mate, black hours whatever you know i think for me that'll be interesting to see now that would go on whereas normally you go listen can you turn the cameras off now i want to say to fox he's not in the he's not in the mix i've lost his phone number please retire never come back to wales <laughs> fuck off to benedorn permanently he's yeah. now, now, he, now he's gonna have to say that you know in, in front of camera let, let me just put a bit of detail on this because we've all alluded to i'm just gonna put for those who don't know so a bbc wales investigates program raised allegations of misogyny sexism and racism in welsh rugby's governing body as a result, the uh, WRU chief exec Steve Phillips has resigned. Performance director Nigel Walker will take over as acting CEO with immediate effect while the WRU search for Phillips' permanent successor. And on Scrum 5 this week, Walker said uh, we described the allegations raised in the documentary as harrowing and despicable. He said the tone of the Welsh Rugby Union today is one of contrition, remorse and apology to those employees who went through what they went through and a desire to get things right. Was this news to you? Did you ever have, like... And I'm not, I mean, I know you're a player, but you know, you're, you're obviously quite a senior Welsh legend. I'm not suggesting for a moment you were ever part of it, but did you ever hear people complaining or? I'll tell you what, Ken Owens will be able to answer this question. He put his blazer on and he's yeah, yeah, he, get him up yeah, he's, on, he's on board, uh, board meetings and everything. Look, I think <coughs> like, I wasn't aware of any of this, and obviously, these allegations are extremely serious. And um, like the tone of the union now seems that they're doing right by these allegations, doing a formal investigation from an external um, company. Um, so look, it's it's not a good look at all. And you know, you just hope that the correct uh, procedures are done. Um, but for me personally, I've never experienced or heard of anything really. How distracting do you think it is? Or is there so much noise in Welsh rugby at the moment, it's just another sort of drumbeat? I think, <laughs> In the past six nations you've been involved in, like I think the year we won in 2019, the the week of the Scotland game, there was talks of mergers going on yeah. and boys being shipped up to North Wales to play. And I think um, you know Gats will be making sure that the boys um, focusing on that, not what's going on around, because you'd hope that the right things are being done externally. I think if anything, it actually makes Wales more dangerous. Um, the playing group, obviously, you know, there's turmoil and all those allegations. We want to see them investigated. And, and I think, you know, the world today and particularly rugby probably needs to investigate those areas. But there's been so much noise, so many different drum beats going on in Wales that I think Warren, knowing Warren, he will circle the, the wagons and he will go, listen, our opportunities to focus on rugby and on the performance on the field. Mm. And, and there can be distractions and there, and there will be distractions going forward. But we have a chance actually to, to really instill some pride for the Welsh rugby community. You know, I think Wales across the board for me over the last, well, as long as I can remember, probably have been the team that have, have overperformed really. Yeah. You know, every year we've gone in and said, oh, you know, they're really struggling and they haven't got the players. You go to the Millennium Stadium and you get 80,000 avid Welsh fans singing that anthem and it, and it makes the hairs on your neck stand and, and the players perform and, and they improve on the back of the way that, that, that they are supported, in my belief. Um, so I think they're probably in a, in a more dangerous position. Let's hope, as you say, that that is sorted out. Just coming to you, Tins, on... I suppose the job for Warren Gatlin. So nine losses in 12 last year. They got obviously got pulled all over the place a bit during the autumn. Lost to Australia 39-34. Lost to Georgia 13-12. Then snuck home against Argentina by seven before, I suppose, getting put away by the All Blacks. So Gatlin comes back in. Nine defeats in 12. Look at the squad that, that he's named. Obviously, the background noise we've discussed. Where do you start? What, what, is he, what are the three <coughs> things he's going to do to get this Wales um, side up again? Well, luckily, he knows... Uh, I think, well, one of the downsides to it is there isn't much player turnover in terms of new players coming in. There's a lot of, you go through that squad, there's a lot of names he will have worked with for 
God knows how many years. I mean, it's great to see uh, Alan Wynne Jones coming back at seventy-two years old uh, for another for his his fiftieth Six Nations. Seventeen Six Nations. Oh. Is that what it is? Seventeen Six Nations. Yeah. I you mean, caught up with him recently. I mean, how the hell is he finding the energy and enthusiasm to do it after seventeen years? Let alone the ability. Yeah, I don't know. Seventeen Six Nations. That's just. Amazing. He's probably not off to Copenhagen and yeah. <laughs> Dubai. Yeah, he's not the candle of both ends. <laughs> I, th- I think he's going to be relying heavily on Christ. Uh, Christ <laughs> just does that. Does that to, yeah. to just the Lord play a big role in the game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Lord plays a very he's, big game. He's that desperate. He's put someone in called Christ. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's going to be hard for them. Um, yeah, they are. They're low, on, they're low on morale, I would imagine. Um, not great on form. But, you know, Gats is proven that he can turn things around and he you know he will know the players he's working with um there are a couple of new you know sort of new names in there but he sticks with what he knows so you you get he's you go i'm not going to say it's Warren Ball, but you're going to get something that's quite simple allows allows the boys to just probably set piece win their physicality and then and then see what they can get off the back of it. I think concerningly for him is he hasn't been given the free reign that he would have liked. He hasn't been allowed to bring all the coaches that he would have liked, and he hasn't been given the, the, the carte blanche that he would have liked. Um, so I, I certainly think he's being hamstrung to a certain extent, um, and all the drama in around WRU is, is certainly not helping him either. Um, he, he will definitely have an effect. Um, it's just whether or not he can get it done quickly enough. Well, one thing Gats always makes makes the boys feel that they can, you know, go out there and beat anyone. I remember my first autumn in 2010, we were playing New Zealand, and he goes, team meeting before you go on the bus. Boys, just think at half past five, people will be saying in the pubs, Wales beat the All Blacks. Let's go. I thought I was going to beat the All Blacks. We lost by 20, yes. <laughs> but, like, I, I had that For feeling. a moment. For yeah. a moment, I Plus. thought, right, yeah. I, and he'll, he'll, have, he'll give those boys confidence, and I see them emphasising on the kicking game, and they'll probably go down emphasizing on their physicality and defense to restrict. Um, like, I think you can get most gain when you change a coach and set up from your defense. Um, and I think they'll probably pick it accordingly. I think there'll be more safer aerial game um, and tactical like that. Three away games doesn't help them either. No. Let's be honest. Oh. It's a tough, it's a tough, they've got France away. Um, they've got Ireland. Scotland Ireland away. away. Blues away. Uh, Scotland and Italy away. Yeah, I, I would say this. So, so, so when I was on the, the Lions tour two two thousand seventeen, right? One of the things that I really took away from that tour was just how good the the Welsh players were as individuals. You know, like I obviously knew Wales were good, but I think sometimes with the way they wanted to play and the the, the stuff that was going, you know, on and and the kind of the type of coaches they had. Ironically, it was Gats. I thought that yes, he got the best out, and they, they often beat people in the big games but actually some of them as individuals were were incredible and I think the one thing that's been talked down about this squad when actually if they wound up and put in the right direction there's some very 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 good players in here that you know maybe haven't had the framework maybe haven't had the confidence maybe haven't been given the free reign to, free reign to go out and put, um, perform and so actually I think it's a big under, you know a lot of people underestimating this Wales squad when actually you look at it there's some f- pretty great players in there and actually I think with the right coaching, hopefully with some renewed um, confidence, they can actually go and do a job. I, I really would be much more positive about it. I know there's some old heads, and I think that is a problem. There is some maturity there. But actually, some of these guys you know, probably haven't performed as well as they could do. But when they do play for their clubs, like they're next level. Like I was very, very surprised just how good the individual Welsh players were. It's quite easy to give them a good siege mentality this time. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's coming at us. We've got three away games. We've got our number one in the world at home. Union and disarray. No, yeah, no one's going to... Everyone's expecting us to fail and see what the players are made of. Pick me someone then who needs a really big campaign. I mean, Alwyn Jones, I think probably probably does if he wants to carry on going to World Cup. You know what I mean? I think there's a leg- you know a legacy there that you know he's talked about for a while. You know, did he has he played that well in the last few games? Uh, you know, there was obviously talk talk about whether he was the right man for the job. Was he holding other players back? I think he will want to go big. I think he needs to do that. I think for his own sort of mentality, because you never want to be a player. And he said it in his own in his own terms when we interviewed him down in Wales. He wants to be there on merit. He's someone that drives standards. So I think for for me, I really want to see him stand up and actually make a profound difference. He he discovered a new type of play um, under your man. You know, with the offloading game. I think P-back. P-back, We need to now go back to you know getting that balance right with him. You know, carrying well and also you know offering that real physicality and destructive defence. I think uh, I think whoever plays ten with it. If it's Dan Bigger, I think he needs a massive tournament and being able to move move them around the field. 
um, really can sort of get that control back that we know that Dan Bigger can do uh, when he's all singing. Um, and if if he can boss them around the field, we know how good a load of their players are, whether it be Josh Adams, whether it be George North, whether it, you know, Liam Williams, whoever it might be, you know, obviously Lewis Reese Samet's out for maybe until round three or something. Yeah. Um, you know, they've got the players that they can, as Has just said, that they can play. And I think you just need someone who's pulling that together and that's going to be, the t- you know, that nine ten link. Who do you look at, Jordan, when you look at the squad list and think that is the person to take this team by the scruff of the neck? You know, Alan wins, obviously, he's been there and it, that's the easy one. Um, I think... You know, at some stage, you have to say he's he's on the slide. Yeah, um, he still can contribute, but he's he's not the same player as he was two th- two three years ago. Um, for me, you know, up front is is probably where you look at it. I think across the back line, as good as any side in, in the prem in the, in the Six Nations, up front five and, and Ken Owens for me is probably the, the the man that needs to be on the field, step up and and, and get it done. Um, my opinion. We love Chairman Ken. Um, I was going to say to you, pick us someone who not necessarily has to have, but you think could be a proper breakthrough star um, for Wales. A lot of people talk about Tommy Reffel. Yeah, I, I think Jack Morgan. Okay. Um, I think he's been in great form. He was involved in last year's Six Nations. Um, like the, the the back row potentially of like Tips, Jack and Toby. That's a, a great back row. And, um, you know, I think... Um, so J- Jack, you know, could really put a marker down. Um, he he had an opportunity in the autumn. He went pretty well, and I'm sure he'll be hungry to really cement his his spot in that team. I think with like Talupe, if he plays well, Wales play better. Yeah. If he if when he's really singing, he he lifts he lifts Wales. He's so. Wales' best player. But it's interesting so. when you when you look at it when you look at it like you said, Tipperick, uh, Falatau, Liam Williams, uh, Dan Bigger, Alan Wynne Jones. Ken Owens, George, so, you know George. Uh, mate, there is, there is. So they've been George. there a while, haven't they? Yeah, they've, yeah. they've all been there a while, but they've all got experience. They're not phased, and actually, if you were to take them out, they all can create moments of magic in different areas. They all have that ability, and that's why I'm a bit like we talked down about this Welsh Welsh side for a long time. Actually, I don't think they're going to be that far off if he can work the magic and they can stay fit, and they're not going to be distracted. Other than the fact that you tipped Italy to beat them. Ten minutes. Ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yes, don't oh, criticise oh, the changing oh, horse. Oh, yeah. I'm allowed to do that. I'm now, I'm now a rugby <laughs> pundit. I'm, 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 it's yeah. the Clive Wilbur yeah, school of mentality. I can literally just make up whatever I want to do. <laughs> Here's one for you, Fox. Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Wales, England, uh, Italy, Wales, France, Wales. Which is the biggest game for your countrymen in this? Is it a case of as long as we beat the English, we don't care, or is there a is there a game here which you think could define this? I think first up sets the tone. Yeah, always for the tournament. Um, There's always a bit of niggle as well with Wales, Wales with Ireland. Ireland yeah, but I don't. I don't think I. Did, I looked earlier. I don't think Ireland have beaten Wales in Cardiff for over ten years in Six Nations in Cardiff. Good stuff. He's almost yeah. done his research. I. I, I thought I because I, I was involved in that game, but. We did go on to win the championship that year. So <laughs> He's like, always got a comeback, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah. So either I didn't way, play the bad one, but yeah. Who is to yeah. say, if I was involved, <laughs> yeah. Wales do well. So no, I think, I think, um, so it hasn't been great hunting ground for Ireland. 2019. Did we win? No, that wasn't the Six Nations game. It was a World Cup, was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't come at the ba- don't come at the king. No, Better not miss. Just, so no, I think. Um, so you think that other we're small competition? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, friendly it was friendly, mm. but no, I think um, first up is a massive. And game. where are your levels of com- confidence? No, like like we, as Hass was talking there, like you you hear the names that's in that squad, and it's so much experience, and there's talent and uh, talent as well. Um, so no, I think we'll be in a good spot. Like quietly going under the radar is where. Um, as Welshman and uh, like to be. I can't wait to see who they pick in the back row. I think yeah. that's key, particularly for that Irish match, because you really need to match the the Irish back row in, in regards to firepower. And we know Falatau can do that. Um, and Tommy Raffel is an amazing guy over the ball. Um, it's where they pick in around that. If it's Tipperick, if you know what that what that looks like, Morgan. Um, that back row. It's a back row battle for me yeah. in, in Wales Island. 
refer would have been at Leicester with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brought him. Are through you through. are you impressed at how he's kicked that, on? Was that you just taking credit then? Yeah, brought him through. Well, yeah. not, not me, <laughs> but the academy. Right, nothing. Said, to do that's what he said. You said, yeah, yeah we well, brought actually, him through. Uh, I was watching TV the other day, and and they, uh, I, mu- I must say, a massive shout out must go to Brett Deacon, who basically did a lot of work with Will Evans and Tommy Raffel, who came through in this sort of same age bracket, and on, a, and on a weekly basis, he worked with them on their sort of positioning over the ball, and sort of they, they both got a massive shout out, shout out as being like the two really great out- groundhogs. And that was, you know, work that he was doing with from 15, 16, 17 years of age, putting in the right positions, you know, making them compete. Um, but both of those those guys were in Leicester's academy when I was there as a coach. I didn't bring <laughs> either of them through, but I uh, did. But did uh, on your CV though, yeah, John. Did, did, did Deeks teach him the the left handed straight through or not? <laughs> no, no, he, hook. He, he, he kept that quite a, uh, quite nicely <laughs> hidden. He hasn't really had that out since his playing days. <laughs> so so this is what I'm uh, one of the most underrated. Hook, you go on. Left, his left hook, left hook, right uppercut. Just take your head off its shoulders, devastating. People don't see it coming because everyone fights like linearly. He just comes out of nowhere. You don't even see it. Yeah. Well, he's, 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 he's southpaw, so he throws a left from his chest. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. And then Jim yeah. Hamilton just pushes you stag, in the bins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a stag. Me and Foxy were on his stag together. Yeah. Were you? Never met him before. Well, I played <laughs> a, I was invited on his stag by Benji. Right. So I was, we, we had a social in France on the Friday. Yeah. And at like 10 o'clock on the Friday night, Benji walks into the pub. And he just had his bicep reattached. And that's said, what, was that after the machete attack? Uh, no, no, that oh, was another thing. Yeah, <laughs> another story. Uh, um, and he goes, uh, I said, do you want a pint? And he was like, no, no, I'm off to Ibiza in the morning for a stag do. I was like, all right, who's stag do? And he was like, Brett Deacon. And um, he said, oh, you should come. There's loads of space. I said, I've never met him before. He, said, he sent one message and he said, yeah, plenty of room. <laughs> so I put my pint down, booked a flight at 10 o'clock at night. And then stayed out till early hours in the morning. And then 6.30, Benji rings me. He says, come on, boy, we're going on a, we're going on the stag. I was like, no chance, no way. I, I was done. He's like, come on, I need you. So next thing you know, I'm on a plane to Ibiza for the day. Good addition. Believe, good addition that. to walk into yeah. the pool party as you're there and Foxy walks in. You're like, hey, good yeah, addition. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. On good. we go. What, little exactly. pair of Speedos rig out, looking yeah. fire. Young yeah. face, moisturized for the injury's life. Yes, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I think you had a time Excellent. for a fake tan as well, did you? Yeah, I got it, got it. Did you? Fish. Yeah, exactly. The bait. Uh, okay, well done on Wales. On to Scotland, fourth in last year's Six Nations, seventh in the world currently in the rankings. Gregor Townsend said it's likely to be his last Six Nations. A couple of injuries, Adam Hastings, Darcy Graham, uh, Scott Cummings and Roy Darge all uh, a little bit doubtful. Watson and Fagerson in the squad, but recent fitness concerns. Scotland, lead us away. Where are Scotland right now? That, isn't that Above the Newcastle? <laughs> Brilliant. Where is it, Scotland rugby team right now? Uh, that's the eternal question, isn't it? They show bits of genius. Um, you think they've turned a the corner, and then you know they won the first two games out last year. Everyone's going grand slam, grand slam. Lose, lose their last three games. So, uh, no doubt they can beat anyone on their day, but d- still don't have any confidence to back them for a, for a title, which is which is. Sad, really, because if you go through their team, I think they're in a really strong place with with how strong their squad is. I think that it's, I'd say, over the last three years, it's been the best squad that Scotland have had for a long time. And would you then say on the back of it they're underperforming? I think consistency-wise, yes. Uh, but I still would always buy a ticket to watch them because when they click, I think they're, I think they're outstanding to watch. They've gone really well in the Calcutta Cup recently, and that's obviously the first, I think we're four of the last five. Yeah. Um, that's up first. How do you call that coming in? We'll obviously come on to England, but from what you're seeing in Scotland at the moment, yeah, Scotland is is the biggest conundrum for me. Um, similarly, you know, f- for a long time we've kind of said, oh, exact to echo what Tins has said, you know, we, we've gone, oh, this is the year, this is the year, and then they've let us down. Um, I've been frustrated over my last year with Scotland for that reason you know I've back and gone you know they're going to go well and, and they've consistently let me down so I'm going to go the opposite way this year and say Scotland are going to let me down um, <laughs> I think st- you know the big game the first one is 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 pivotal you know like Foxy said about Wales Ireland that one just gives Scotland confidence if, if they get there but I see England winning that uh, I think Scotland are good for two wins this year and um, just a couple of the, the niggles and a couple of the injuries will hurt them um, although their performances at, at club level and, and recently have been pretty pretty good yeah, I think, yeah, just I'm going to go for two wins. Why have they had the hex on England? Uh, look, I think there's always been, um, you know, the old, obviously old rival that everyone talks about. I think just recently, um, remember there was that game where they came back all the way to a to a yeah, to th- a draw. Thirty one nil up. Yeah, and, and, and came back. Draw. And I just think, again, I think Scotland are a, a team that was just a flatter to deceive. You know, the, the, there's been the talk of this kind of turnaround. I think the faffing around with. 
with Finn Russell and that you know in and out and and selection policies and sort of drama a little bit off the field. I think it's been disjointed. I think again, you know, for a long period of time, you looked at the Scotland team years ago. It was Patterson was kicking all the goals, and then they came in, and then you know you suddenly got Hogg, and there's Russell and Hogg, and there was Watson, Russell and Hogg, and you suddenly started adding more and more players. There was a big gap between Patterson and then no, Hogg. No, no, but no, do you, no, do you, no, do you, it's, you it's mean? Only, it's only Scotland player he knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> Let him have no, it. Point, no, I'm talking about the, yeah. the point. It's Gavin of Hastings. Yeah, and... yeah, 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 but fine. Gavin Hastings was the player. Chris Kenny Patterson. Logan. Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah. That was it. That was Andy it. Yeah. All right, yeah. fine. But there wasn't there wasn't a massive handful of of like superstars that you could you could um you could sort of talk about. I think they've got a great squad. I think on the day they can actually beat everyone. I think with England there has been a niggle for a long time, especially under Eddie Jones, where it was always very physical. Even from our first game, we went to Ed we went to Murrayfield, and the belief was that that Scotland were going to beat us, and that that was they genuinely going to work. You know, we got off the bus, people throwing bottles, all that kind of niggle that went on, um, and we ended up filling them in on that particular occasion but I think that the squad teams are much closer I think the squad you know Scotland squad is very very good I think there are some some star players and I don't think the gap now is as big as it was and I think the mentality behind say fans and and journalists is that there is a bigger goal than there actually is and I think Scotland are much closer to, to England I think there's that real fire I think if you asked I mean it'd be a bit of an got interviewed the other day by somebody and he was saying the one team want to beat Scotland I think if you were to ask quite a few of the England players in that team one player they've got under their skin who have, have reeled them back in on a number of occasions probably is um, probably is Scotland. So, look, I, I just think that hopefully this could be their year. I just think you want them to kick on because you don't want them to be the also-rans. If, if this is Townsend's, Townsend's last Six Nations, probably quite hasn't quite done what he should have done um, with the players that he's got because I think they're probably in the best position they've been uh, other than some of these injuries for, for a number of years, <laughs> excluding Patterson, obviously. But is it is it that you... Sorry, I was going to ask a question. Is it that you accept it? That you know, with Finn, you get pure genius, but also you can get, you know, you know, a bit of madness thrown in there that that then leads to you, you sort of losing control of games. I well, mean, you answer the question. Well, would you want, would you well, want to play I outside? Did, I did, I, yeah, I would still love to play. I would still love to be outside him. I think quite like know, some, in some ways. Some so yeah, well yeah, it's just something who can see something that, and if you can learn to read it, and the fact that how close he plays to the line, how happy he is, and comfortable at, at you know they talk about slowing down sort of time, that's what he does, and uh, and I think there's something to say about his mentality and the fact that mistakes he can brush mistakes off and just next minute he, he'll he'll do another one. He did, um, so yeah, that's why I would always say that Scotland are buy a ticket to. Because I, I think that you, you pick nines, get the ball in his hands as quickly as you possibly can, fast rocks as Scotland used to, and magic is going to happen. Would you pick him as a coach, though? I mean, as a fan, yes, but, but as a head coach, you or know, director of con context is everything. So, so I don't know the exact context of what, what went on in, in the environment of what sort of Gregor Townsend is trying to achieve. Yeah. Obviously, he, he has f felt that in some way Finn Russell has let the team down yeah. because that was the rhetoric coming out of the side. And I think on occasions that needs to be done. So if they have curfews and he's being a ringleader, and I don't know this is the fact, this yeah. isn't this is one of them, I'm saying this is if, um, if there are curfews and the team agree on something and then there's you know four or five guys that decide to go for late beers and get a bit loose and come in and, and, and they're you know not able to train the next day or haven't checked in for physio appointments you have to draw the line and draw the line in the sand somewhere and that's what i think i'm assuming that gregor townsend has done that the fact that he's sort of got him back into the squad now you'd hope you'd learn from that lesson you'd actually say hold on i'd rather be in on the inside than on the outside and yeah. you'll see a better performance from him this year and actually take those leadership responsibilities seriously um I don't know. I don't have the detail, but the, the, something's gone on. Obviously, to leave a player of his caliber out of the squad, he's he's seriously pissed him off. So I think hopefully it's it's you know you build the relationship and you actually go, what's best for Scottish rugby? I played the hey, so I played the snitches. Yeah, snitched. Get when snitches. They were having a beer. But, but Jordan, just to get back to, would you be comfortable in games of this magnitude and significance and pressure? to go with the risk-reward ratio of Finn Russell over, which is high, there's a big gulf between the two relative to a, a Dan Big or an Owen Farrell. Yeah, but if that's about, you know, the conversations that you have. You know, you want him to play his game, but you want him to be sensible with it. You don't want him just th flipping everything out the back door and throwing 50-50s all the time. There has to be an element of make the right decisions for the team. He has to control the team. You're an international 10. Unfortunately, you're not going to win games if your 10 isn't controlling the game. Now, you still want him to play and you still want him to be ambitious and, and actually to have a crack, but you can't have him playing for himself. It can't be the Finn Russell show. It has to be the Scotland show. He, he I He's, think he has to put confidence in... Gregor Townsend and the boys like he, he he can't just say right we're picking you go and do what you want if he goes like I understand how we want to play and boys then um, 
get a feeling for that, then they, they obviously will play for him. They, then they love playing with him. So I think it's like it goes b both ways. If Gregor Townsend puts confidence in Finn to come back in the squad, then it's, it has to be going back the other direction, I feel. Like. I think Finn Russell's been quoted this week basically coming out saying, look, I, I want to be part of this team for a long time. I want to play really well. I don't know what the exact quote is, but it, it is something like that. Um, and I think he's the, he's the best 10 to, to lead them on. I think they'll be highly motivated. I think they'll want to kick on. Again, you look at, look at, you know, look at the team they've got there. You know they've got they've got obviously got Hog they've got Cameron Redpath who's been who's been um, not been fit they've got uh, Dwayne Van der Merve you've got uh, uh, McConaughey who's obviously now found out he's got a Scottish grandparent in the mix um, you know you've got Sam Skinner you've got Roy Southern you've got Hamish Watson you've got Johnny Gray Richie Richie Gray Matt, uh, Sander Fagan you know, I mean the potentially injured but they've got they've got some incredible players there that can do an absolute job that have world class experience it's now or never to kick on and they can't be the can't be the also runs not equally. The Scottish public, if they win England, beat England, just shut up <laughs> for five minutes. No one tip them to win anything, and then they'll probably just go on and win it. But they don't need the hype because the hype derails them for some reason because it, it seeps into the camp. I think. Are we going four then for Finn Russell as the one to watch? W would any of you want to throw another name in there? Rory McConaughey is a brilliant. I said player. Cameron Redpath if, he, if he's fit because you know remember his Will debut game against. Well, I, don't, I think, you know... Two plus two? Two plus two, Harris. Two plus two, yeah. and Harris. I, I think, two. you know, any sort of combination of those three would be really good for me to see. Um, yeah. You know, you stick Russell outside. Two plus two, I think, is good for Russell because he gives him that really direct edge, you know, yeah. to take a little bit of pressure off him, let him play flat to the line, and you know you've got a hard runner there. Chris Harris is a shoe-in, um, and you bring Redpath on off the bench with 25 to go and just let him run riot. I think... You know that that's when Scotland have their have their best opportunity. Um, you went two wins, didn't you? How many wins for Scotland? In, in, into your microphone, please, Michael. It's a, <laughs> it's a podcast. Sorry, I didn't realise that. Um, I was just saying they've got three home games, haven't they? Uh, I think they've got Italy and yeah, they've they got go Wales at home. England, Scotland. Then they go Scotland, Wales. Then they go France, Scotland away. Obviously, yeah, got then they France, go Scotland, they got France and England away, and, and everyone Italy else last. at home, haven't they? So yeah, yeah I uh, I think they'll. They'll get two, maybe upset a third. Interesting. I mean, I said they were going to lose to Italy, so. <laughs> but then I changed my mind again. They're Changing going to be horse mid-race. All right. Um, let's move on to England. Um, Steve Borthwick is in, just in case you haven't been following your rugby recently. Eddie Jones has left the building. Kevin Sinfield, Nick Evans and uh, Richard Cockle making up his, uh, his coaching panel. Fifth in the world currently. Third in last year's Six Nations by the skin of their teeth. Uh, injuries are playing quite a prominent part of it. So Henry Slade, the latest to withdraw uh, from the Calcutta Cup. Elliot Daly is out for 12 weeks. Courtney Law still struggling with bits and bobs. Luke Count Dickey is out with an ankle injury. Jamie George may or may not be fit, uh, having passed his return to play um, protocol with uh, concussion. And Tom Curry is out with hamstring injury. Lead us off, Hask. A brand new, bright new dawn for English rugby. Yes or no? I think it's going to be a challenge. I think that... Um only one coach has come in and won a Six Nations in their first year, and that was Eddie Jones. Wood, We're back there again. No, 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 no. But I'm just saying it was interesting. Woodward didn't do it. Robinson didn't do it. Ashton didn't do it. You know, Will Borthers break the mould? I think actually, yes. I think he could be capable of, t of doing that. I think his mentality, the coaching staff, the renewed energy. I mean, Maro Toji came out in the papers this week and said that we probably needed a change. It wasn't good enough, which I think is a probably a bold statement, especially from Maro because he, you know, he enjoys his time on the middle of the fence. Um, and I think... You know, they're obviously reinvigorated. I think Borters will do a good job. I think injuries will, 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 will play a part. But the one thing that England has is a lot of depth. You know, you're, you know transitioning, you know, uh, uh, Henry Slade out and, and Anti Watson back in. You know, that's pretty special re replacement. Anti Watson, obviously, you know, his comeback game against uh, for Leicester <laughs> scored an absolute wonder try. He'll be very frustrated, but very excited to be back in the mix. You know, Jamie, J you know, Jamie George coming back in. Uh, from an injury again world class player lion i think england are spoiled for for riches i think all they're missing is motivation um a couple of ref, you know refreshed game plan but nothing too over the top and two or three percent better and they're going to do very well in the six nations i genuinely believe it and they'll be reinvigorated and, and a new broom sweeps all clean and i think it'll be quite nice for the for the you know reinvigorated twickenham crowd come come next weekend pick me your 10 12 13 <laughs> Please. Why do I always get it, Foxy? What do you think? Um, I, I think I think now with the loss of Slade, I, I think you you are going to see Marcus Farrell and Manu. Uh, you know, I think 
I think Lawrence is, puts his name up. I think he's been playing really well for, for Bath, but I think they'll go with to Alangi. Marchant is another option. Marchant is another option, which, but I don't think they're going to go that way. They could just go Lawrence and Manu and just go f- some beast down the middle, um, which would worry a few people. But uh, then it all depends about who's who's going to play those roles at the back and who's your other kicking option. So I don't think they'll do that. Um, but it would be quite nice to see that. Bit mammoth. It depends on selection. England's opportunities for me. Um, Smith Farrell doesn't work as a ten twelve. Yeah, really doesn't yeah, work because agree. it doesn't work. It hasn't worked in any of the big games. Farrell's a ten uh, for me. He's got the ability to play twelve, but for me, he is your first choice ten. Um, and regardless if you have, uh, for me, when you go Manu and, and Ollie Lawrence, I'm thinking uh, it's going to cause a lot of issues. But what are England going to do? What, what way are they going to try and play? Well, they're going to have a refined game plan. It's going to be very much towards that Saracens, that Leicester model that was successful the other year. It's going to be box kick, forward dominance, uh, you know, really play that control. And if you're playing that game, you want a really sound defence, which is probably those two boys. But does uh, does Farrell, Manu (coughs) and Ollie Lawrence not just like with Nick Evans coming as your attack coach? Well, that's why it's it's, it's a tough one for Nick Evans, obviously, because he's worked with Marcus Smith um, on a weekly basis. And I know he's on secondment from Quinns, but it, it makes it you know, difficult for him because I'm sure he, he will want to pick Marcus Smith. He will, you know, want Marcus Smith to, to shine and, and to have, you know, great moments. Marcus Smith, what he does for Harlequins on a weekly basis, I'm blown away by. Absolutely blown away by the way his talent and his skill set. Uh, he hasn't really had the opportunity to do that on an international stage just yet. Um, and, and, and I don't think it's worked with him and, and Owen Farrell. And, and for, for no reason, that's no criticism of, of either of them. Just the balance of the way they play. Marcus Smith doesn't look comfortable in that environment whether that's an international stage mm. or whether that's just having a faz outside you and that experience you yeah. know bossing you and taking the ball out of your hands when you know you want to just play off the cuff um or oh, whether or the way the way eddie eddie was trying to set it up and eddie was trying to play the last two years have but we my, my biggest worry over england since that sort of world cup is their creativity so they haven't really created opportunities yes they won games they won that autumn autumn nations cup the first year after and and they got some wins, but they're, they're not. They used to be creating so many opportunities, and that's not happening. And right, is Steve going to come in and go right? Are you going to pick a Jack Van Portfleet? But if you're going to pick a, someone who's going to play at such a speed, is Faz the right guy to play ten? That's that. Or are we going to go back to Ben Youngs and Owen Farrell? And then you know, yes, you, yes you've got two hundred and thirty cats. Well, two hundred and twenty cats for, between them. For me, the way England played in the last twenty-five minutes of all of their autumn fixtures is the way they should play the game. Um, you know, really exciting, throwing the ball around. There's, there's obviously cards in, thrown into that factory, but they actually looked exciting. They've got the ball to the edge, and you've got some of the players there. You're looking at that. Ollie Hassel Collins, yeah. hugely exciting. Caden Murney, ball in hand, one on one opportunities on the edge. They are going to create like real, real danger. Freddie Stewart on the inside of that, you know, mm. it, it's an exciting side. But again, selection is, is the key and, and the balance of the way they want to play. Yeah, exactly. The style of play is key. If you're going to go kick heavy, run hard and then you know who they're going to pick but if they if you want to play with tempo and a bit of creativity then it's got a suit as well you can't pick a certain players because of experience to play a way that they're not comfortable so it's it's, it's a big decision and you'll probably see well, what we'll see now this week it's quite it's quite shocked at, there's quite a few low real low cappers in there obviously surrounded by some really well some Punchy cappers, yeah. There's five, you know what five five on cap, but then you've got Van Poelvliet's got seven. You you've got uh, Alex Mitchell's got one. Um, Freeman, Dolly Lawrence has got seven. Dan Kelly's got one. Uh, Tommy Freeman's got three. You know, Jack Willis six. You've got lots of really. Is that a concern with the World Cup seven months away? Uh, my, my not really. I my thing would be now is finding consistency. Consistency right. in the selection, consistency in who you want to play. Yes, you can you can wiggle around with that. Uh, you know, two three players can come in and out, but we don't need him to be using twenty thirty players, thirty five players going through this. You need to be getting consistent an idea. There's two things. Sorry, is that just regarding the, the cap thing? So that so I remember um, as it Stuart Lancaster did a kind of review, and to win a to win a World Cup, you needed over. Something like twelve hundred. Yeah, it? no, it was like eight hundred caps, something like that across the squad was it was a number that everyone that ever won a World Cup had had over a certain amount of a certain amount of caps. That's why when he was in charge, and he talked about the two thousand fifteen World Cup. He was more excited about the two thousand nineteen because he said by the time the two thousand fifteen squad gets to two thousand nineteen, they will make a World Cup final. 
they did. The other, the other thing I want to talk about, but Jordan, Jordan might know a bit more about this, Tins, you, you obviously coached. When you've got to think about this with your business head on, right, not your emotional head on in terms of, of, of picking players, is if you're coming in, right, what, what is it you hang your, your hat on? Because every team that I've ever worked with where they've had short-term success, so Gatland and Eddie Jones, for example, right, came in and had pretty clear game plans. So Gatland had Warren Ball going to working your way to the edge. Players got the, um, their hands on the ball. Defence was very aggressive, you know, pretty simplistic in terms of what you would do, motivated by pure emotion. You had your hands on the ball, and that was a pretty key game plan. When Eddie came in, he said, I'm going to reset back to what England could have. Good set piece, real physical defence, attack will take care of itself. Emotionally, it's very easy to implement that. And it's very easy for you to be able to review that and go, right, lads, how quickly do you get off the floor? How hard do you hit people? How many times do you get over the gain line? And the play and the flow takes time to build. Now, Steve Borthwick comes in. You talk about style of play. What does Steve Borthwick want to be known as? Well, in the press, he's talking about uh, you know, re getting an under players getting back on an understanding, getting back to where England want to be, uh, you know, uh, emotionally correct. What do you do? Because you can't implement some crazy new attack plan in two weeks. What can you hang your hat on, which is probably massive physicality in defence? You've got Kevin Sinfield, probably one of the most emotional leaders the game's seen. Does amazing stuff on and off it. What's he going to do? Reinvigorate the lads. So the lads are going to be kicking fuck out of people. That's what they want them to do. And then game plan wise, what do you want people to do? You're going to try to put incre uh, you know, uh, really intricate moves in? Or has Nick Evans got a remit to get the guys over the game land to create these edges on, um, opportunities on the edge and be very, very direct? And I think that when you've got to understand your first six nations, you need simplicity. You need everyone that's seen from the same hymn sheet, low numbers of caps. How are they going to go out and play with some? ability to, to to build in some creativity because that's how you guys would do right. it and, and emotionally you can t it's very easy to stand in front of a meeting and go right lads simple game plan these three are targets on the scotland side we're going to get after him we're going to get after him we're going to get after him you boys are going to go over the game line this is how we're going to play we're not going to play too much in our own half we're going to attack down there whenever we get into their 22 the lights come on and we go turbo and that is an easy way of managing a team whereas a lot of people think oh they're going to come out with some real good game you can't manage that in two weeks you can't play that and i think that will dictate how England will play. I like that. When the lights come on, we're going to go turbo. Yeah. Have you ever thought about coaching? No. <laughs> no, I just don't have the attention to detail. I'm great at top line stuff, great at post-match, great I like team great, great great his, his coaching is just sending another coach's book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. good. Improve your life. Sorry, Jordan, you were going to add no, some I, words. I think, bang, you hit the nail on the head. I think that's exactly what England will do over, over the next coming weeks. It, it actually, interestingly, you know, with, with the numbers of injuries going up, it's, it's actually the balance of how hard you can train because you start, you know, getting bangs in training. And, and that sort of starts getting diluted. But looking at that squad, it's it's really exciting. You know, I think that's the way England will play. They will be physical, they're massively physical, mass massively forward orientated with that Kevin Sinfield defence, you know, which is going to make it tough for the opposition. It's going to be a, a huge kicking game. And, and actually the, 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 the kicking balance in the back three for England is, 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 is where, again, where I think needs to be looked at because, you know, I don't think Caden Murney and, and Ollie Hassel Collins are, are renowned kickers of the ball for Eddie mm -hmm. Stewart. You know, there'll be a, an element of pressure on him to, to kick the ball. Um, but the, the flip side of everything, Hask, is, is that's the way we think England are going to play. The opposition will know that, and they'll be trying to pick that apart as well. So it, it, it'll make that those 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 you know the I balance think, is really fine. I think as well when you when you look at it um, from a point of view of someone like Borthas. So Borthas was born in the the fire of an Eddie Jones coaching regime across different countries. He will see, especially with coming into Leicester, you know, to come into Leicester and to change that round in one year, and to, yes, they were playing quite creatively by the end of it. But what was their fundamentals? I think both it will go back to the fundamentals to so have an understanding of like when did England look good? Well, Julie said, right, the last 20 minutes, what they're doing in the last 20 minutes, B fast ball, getting over the gain line, uh, uh, moving the point of contact, very physical in defense, not playing 50 50s, respecting the ball. So immediately, um, that's what you're gonna you're gonna see from from England because that's how you could, that's what how they want to play. So I imagine it will be fast and hard, kicking in the right areas, and also you know probably playing the percentages a little bit. You know, saying do we want to be overplaying in our in our half? Do we want to see that? Probably not against Scotland side that do have the ability to carve you up. You know, a couple of loose balls. Finn Russell's specialty is fucking getting it wide, wide, wide and playing or kicking through. Your cross field kick. kick. You can't do that. So I think you will see that. And then hopefully, I think the plan will be uh, under Borthers then to progress and whether whoever replaces Nick Evans will be to build into that. But I think you don't pick Owen Farrell as captain unless you want him to to dictate how things are going to go. And, uh, you know, and ironically, I think you're going to see the same thing from Wales. Just going back to Gatland, you know, what does he implement in a, in a two-week period? What gives you emotional energy? Big hits over the game line. 
that's what you, that's what you hang your hat on. That's when you review it. You go, fucking hell, lads, we did well. Yeah, yeah that's the you know foundation is gonna be set, and the values are gonna be the physicality and the defense and kicking game probably, and then they'll probably look to add and grow from there with their attacking game. And knowing boards that we like compete on every play. Like so, you know, the first thing I, I would say in any meeting was, do we get beaten to any loose ball? No. You know, if there's anything, you know, with someone like I mean, Courtney Laws is missing, but if there's a long kick, you know, when you look at the analysis and, and Scotland are fielding the ball, you want to have five England players in that picture straight away. So on 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 the TV, you're seeing five players swarming. So that'll, all, that'll be the mentality because that's easy to manage, isn't it? Basically, it's a metric. Because of the physicality we're talking about, yeah. Six Nations is going to be won by yellow and red cards. Right. No, no change there then for the last sort of no. couple of years. Um, pick me your back row quickly. Um, well, because when, when you were talking about, like, like you've got, Ben Earl back in. You've obviously. Yeah, I mean, got I'd start. I'd have Earl. Um, Lewis Ludlam. Would you put Mario to six? I don't know. No, I mean, look, got, well, now uh, Sam now, Simmons or Alex Dombrow well, to eight. No, I mean, now Courtney was out. I mean, obviously, we talked about putting Courtney, Courtney and, and, and Mario in the Mario, second yeah. row um, to free up space, and we were going to have Earl, Dombrant, and um, uh, Willis. Didn't we? We had yep. that, but I don't know what. Now that now he's out, um, you know, I'd probably keep Mario in the second row, and I'd I'd keep going with Earl. Um, so you're going Earl. Willis and Don Brand. Yeah, okay. is what I was what I would no, do. L Ludlam on the bench. Ludlam on the bench purely yeah. because uh, I think it, like when Lewis comes on and he's motivated, he's actually one of the biggest, most destructive tacklers out there. And I think he 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 comes on with that ability to get over the game line and brings real energy. I think Earl and Willis just cause absolute havoc. Both them good, you know, ball carriers and Don Brand, you know, just does what he does best. Quick fire, a player you are intrigued to see in England colours this tournament. I'll go Hassel Collins. To be fair. Uh, I think if they give him ball, I think what London Irish. The way Do you think he'll play? I don't know. I think he's. I think he's earned the right to play. I think his strength. Uh, I think if you're going to play physical, he he's he is physical. He's hard to stop. He's difficult to tackle. He can beat you on the outside, or he can he can he hits that line back through, and can step back on the inside and break a tackle and then get an offload away. Uh, so I think you know he's. The things where you never really find out until you're a test player is is what what positionally how he's going to be under the high ball in front of eighty five thousand people those sort of things, um, but has he earned the right? I think he has. I think you know I, I love Anthony Watson. I love watching Anthony Watson play. I think he's just an incredible player. But obviously he's cut, he's come coming back from from injury injury and but I having watched uh, Ollie Hassel Collins over the past sort of year. Yep. If if they can, England can get quick ball and give him the ball, he'll he'll make stuff happen. Okay. I'm being a bit stupid, sorry, not for the first time. If you think about Borders and again set piece battle being the key and wanting to get ball and not risking it, I, I would say looking at it, he, he's going to go Johnny Hill. He's going to go um, Marrow. Ma yeah, ma well, ma yeah, Marrow, and uh, it, to try to put a bit more height and obviously Don Brandt in the in the back row and maybe even um, you know I was looking at. Dave Ribbons, you know whether whether he's you know he's, uh, he's going to pick a line at option. Yeah, he's going to yeah, That's six. yeah. He's got to pick so. a line. You so you're changing your back row now. Yeah, I th I'm saying potentially, you know, okay. you, you might put a Marrow at six and then put Chesham. Chesham gallops about at six, doesn't he? He's, he's played some six. Yeah, I think yeah. think Marrow's a good six. I know there's a huge amount of respect for Ezekwe as well. Yeah. Um. So I think there's some options there, but I think with Earl and, and Don Brand, if that is the mix, um, you you need a line out option, a really thorough a line out option at si uh, at six. It is a genuinely intriguing selection that Steve Borthwick will make. Um. Okay, on to Ireland, second in last year's Six Nations, ranked number one in the world. Does that sit comfortably with you? Yeah, very much so. I, I think they've deserved it over the over the last while. Uh, I think for for a very very long time, you know, it it didn't. Yeah. Um, and almost sort of being Irish, we kind of said, oh yeah. Yeah, you know, we haven't, but, you know, full credit to the team. They, they deserve to be number one in the world. Um, you know, the amount of times they've beaten New Zealand in the, in the last day of things are, are, I suppose, case in point. First Irish team to go and win a test series there last summer. Uh, playing some fantastic rugby. F for me, the Six Nations is probably secondary to what happens later in the year at the World Cup. Mm. Uh, Quarterfinal exit. Well, that's that we we've never made it past the uh, semi final, and, and actually it's it's actually a difficult side of the draw. Uh, you know, you're looking at playing yeah. South Africa in a pool game, two way you get France or New Zealand in a quarter final. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not really that great. I'd rather be on your side, to be quite honest, lads. Yep. Um, but you know, if if Ireland have aspirations to do it, which which we do, um, we have to have a, a Six Nations. I would like Ireland to maybe just expand the playing pool and a, a small amount in the Six Nations um, in saying that, you know, that there's games that you have to go out and, and, and win. Beat Australia 13-10 in November, beat South Africa 19-16. 
tell me sort of where you were netted out at the end of obviously a long year, a huge year in 2022. That those two narrow wins does that tell you Ireland are able to eke out games at times when you know it, it's very much in the balance, or does that tell you that it's all getting quite congested at the top? No, I think so. I think par for for being number one in the world is that teams are bringing their A, a game to you. I, you know, I think you look at the, the Australians who lost to Italy. A very very different side that played against Italy and mm. we talked about that respect and you know okay we're on tour maybe we'll, we'll, we'll just give these guys a run the the, the Australia Ireland game was was a test match the Australia Ar- South Africa sorry the Ireland South Africa game was a test match you know physical really really brutal and it was great to see Ireland you know win those games I think for for a long period of time Irish teams that I was part of you know we, we weren't physical enough we got bullied by New Zealand you know they could drop back into just physically beating you up whereas this Irish team. Um, has got a huge amount of power. You know, I, I talk a lot about the back row and what they give you, you know, going over the line. And, and Ireland have had very, very, been very lucky. Not very lucky, I suppose. It's been par for what they've done with the amount of back rowers that they've brought through in, in the Leinster setup, in the, in the Munster setup, and, in, and the Ulster setup. That, you know, they can get over the gain line and, and they can compete with any team in the world now. Um, I think it, it, it's, it bodes well for Irish rugby. I think Farrell has done an amazing job. Uh, when he took over from Joe Schmidt, you know, his first few games, uh, you know, were in COVID and it was in that. Uh, the nation's cup and and you know there, there was calls oh he's he's not good enough and it was you know he he wanted to expand the way Ireland played he wanted to play you know more a heads up game and he's done that and and you know they're playing a, a game now that's really nice to watch as well. It's re- I, I, I I I think a lot of people would have have a huge amount of sort of respect for Andy Farrell. I just would love to ask you about Paul O'Connell as well because I think he jo- did he join twelve months ago. I think a little bit before just that. Just before um, that, was it? yeah. Um, Paul, just the impact he's had. Yeah, he's been fantastic. Um, he was he was away, obviously learning his trade in, in Stade Francais with Heineke Mayer, and and I know he learned a lot there, uh, and you know kind of figured out the coach that he wanted to be. But but Paul has been, um, for anyone who's met him or come across him, you know he's a really really intense bloke, great bloke, um, but attention to detail and a real passion and a pride, uh, you know, about what he wants to do. So um, definitely, you know, the Irish set piece has been has been great with him there. You know, they've got a guy John Fogarty who does the scrum, who's who's been really detailed as well. Um, and the forward play has been fantastic. When you look at this Ireland squad and Ireland's recent results, do you see an Ireland side that is getting better, that is holding its position, or that, I suppose, over the next seven months is is going to do well to stay where it is? No, I think they're just getting better and better, and that's the scary thing, really. I think we're, when you used to play against Ireland, you used to emphasise, right, we have to match them emotionally going into the game. And if you do that, then you, you had a far better chance. Um... But their attention to detail and the level of execution, the style of play with the ball in hand is just th- that New Zealand test series, some of the stuff they were playing, you know, it to say it was against New Zealand was like mind blowing really because they were so accurate, they executed and they made them made New Zealand look, you know, pretty average at times. And, you know, that's that's the detail and level that they're playing at. And I think it's it goes down to like the the tackle area the, the speed of ball and everyone understanding their roles and executing I think it's um they're at a point where everyone's just comfortable and it's almost like they turn up and they know it's business it's not they don't need that emotional rise when they have that then you're in trouble even more then so I think um they're they're, they're playing at a level um that's worthy of that number one ranking I I thought Sexton was out is he is he now fit to play I think he said he is I okay think. he is fit to play when you're opposite Johnny Sexton you are thinking what? What is the challenge around playing against Sexton? Punch him in the face. Got be, got be a little shy. Because obviously you played with him as well. Yeah. I'm just interested as, you know, he, he so much of Ireland goes through Johnny Sexton emotionally, and, tactically. Yeah. And he he's the driver of that detail as well. Like I, um, I remember on the Lions tour where he'd just be, he'd, ex- he'd expect if you didn't know your role, um, he would get into you and he, you wouldn't want to do that. It's almost like, you know, how people talk about Sean Edwards. You don't want to make a mistake with Sean Edwards. It was almost like that level with Johnny because you just knew that if you made a mistake, he'd call you out and make you feel about like that big. Um, so even, um, though, even though you're a man of the series. <laughs> you still <laughs> listen to him, though. Um, but no, I think he, he, he drives that. And, um, you know, I think f- when you play against him, you just got to take his time away if you stand off. I think you when Wales go up against him next week, I think the line speed will you'd like to think will be huge uh from Wales just to try and take his time away. Are you gonna add to that? 
I'm just no, fascinated uh, your view on No, I think so. I think Johnny, Johnny's been like that since he's a very, very young player. He came through pretty much out of school into into an Irish setup with Ronan O'Gara as probably the first choice Irish ten. And that was Johnny's at you know, MO. He he he's just saying it as is. And he's he's really combative and really angry and he's just he's not shy of throwing a few F bombs around to, to his teammates, whoever, because he expects the very, very highest of standards, which is exactly what you want from your ten. Um and that's it's you know, it's nice to hear that he's he's still doing that because he's not taking back reception. For, for me, Johnny is pivotal to, to Irish hopes and dreams, particularly for the World Cup. Um I would think he's one of the guys I'd like to see, you know, maybe be dragged at 50, 60 minutes, regardless. I think Ross Byrne's a fantastic 10. I think Jack Crowley's done a great job um, in sort of the emerging Ar- Ireland trip to a, um, to South Africa, and he did a great job against Australia. Um, there's some nice options there, and nice opportunities to give guys a little bit of game time if things are going well. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's I think it's a great Irish squad. I think there's some, some fantastic... Robbie Henshaw is missed. Yeah. Uh, he's, I think he's a fantastic player. But Bundy Aki obviously, can come in and do a job. I think those two young... Uh, Jimmy O'Brien and, and Jamie Osborne, both both young kids from from my local club. Um, it was nice to see them going. Particularly Jamie Osborne, as well, I call him a, a kid. He's a giant of a man, but he, again, his performances for Leinster have been hugely impressive. Uh, anywhere really in in the outside backs, um, so it'd be nice to see some guys like that get some field time as well. I was just laughing because you talk about Johnny Zeff bombs, and actually everywhere we go, I mean, I'm not sure Netflix are going to know what's hit them. It's no, it's going to be not, X no. directory before beeping. you know it. Beep. Um, you had a lot to say about Ireland, not recently necessarily, but. Where are your love levels? No, where it's, are your a, it's always been positive. Um, I think. Well, it's not know, always been positive. No, since since Schmidt left, okay. it's been generally well. Actually, it took about a year for uh, what Faz, Catty, um, Paulie, 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 all the Bonner. all the guys who have to come through. But now, there's the nuts and bolts that they built under Schmidt that got them to number one previously, got them those wins against uh, the All Blacks, but was very one dimensional. It was all about eking out penalties, getting in the right area of the field, and then making your forwards get you over the ball. They still have that because it's a very it's a very similar squad to the, what they've always had. But now, you know, they've been whether it's Catty or whoever, they've been given the confidence to go and allow their back three, who are uh, we've always said were one full, but we want to see more in ha- with the ball in hand. And now they're doing it. And I think with the quality that they have, you know, I know Robbie Henshaw's not in there, but Bundyaki, Gary Ringrose. You know, with those guys, they can ex- they can ex- exploit people, and their their efficiency around the ruck, they generate really fast ball, and when you generate fast ball, your defenses are under a lot of pressure, and and they're now maximising that, and they're using it to their advantage. Where, um, you know, uh, before a couple of years ago, they didn't they didn't do that. They stuck to a very very rigid routine, and they've they've just put some they've put they've loosened it off, and it's really worked for them, and they're great to watch. I mean, look, it's pretty. Indicative how well they're playing when you know Josh van der Fleer's is it World Player of the Year or mm. World U- European Player World Player of the Year, whatever it was, you know, back row player absolutely carving up. Um, you know, that's again the nuts and bolts. I think, you know, when you look at that that coaching team, they've all got some pretty standout people with great personalities that are probably emotionally drive the team very well, have that attention to detail, are all super competitive. Uh, I think I'm in a great place. I think that you know deserves number one in the world. I'd say putting you know my hat in the ring and I know nothing about anything I'd say they're, they're 100% favourites to win the Six Nations I know France is are there I mean, but I just think they probably have a slightly more with a bit more experience but the issue is, is what Jordy says that you know Johnny Sexton's pivotal if, if he if he falls down those other guys have had not that much exposure and I think you're right they've got to start earning that because Johnny's not going to be around for, for, for ages you know for a long time you know, not forever and obviously he wants to get to the World Cup but he has had a few issues and I know he is a resilient player and actually I think probably some of his issues are overstated but they're going to have to find a plan B if he if he isn't there because everything runs through him you know they've got three away games but they've got the two that they need to be at home they've got France at home and they've got England at home so and it finishes hopefully with a grand well yeah could be a grand slam game for, for them yeah. against England. Um, oh, sorry, you're going to add? No, no? I, I just think that they're the biggest, obviously, games for Ireland, the home games. Um, yeah. They'll be looking with one eye at France at the World Cup and obviously sort of the belief factor and, and trying to put a little bit of doubt in, in French minds, you know, from, from that home fixture. And that England game, England will be, I'm sure, gunning for uh, higher honours in the competition. I think that could be, again, really exciting weekend. It feels so much of it comes down to the first game Wales against Ireland I mean you, we hear it every year don't you win your first game and then yeah. you're off and running pick me someone Jordan who just I mean we're sort of picking out players as we go but someone to write the, the headlines on the back pages for Ireland this Six Nations you can go obvious you can go a Sexton someone like a Caelan Doris 
Dor- Doris for me. I mean, really fantastic player. Um, it's just uh, amazing. Jo- Joss van der Flair is a fantastic back rower. I think you know the Irish back row there. You know, regardless of who you have, are going to compete. Um, James Ryan has been very very good. Um, got you know Jordan Lammer is is, is probably someone yeah. who I'm a huge fan of. Um, I don't know exactly how he fits into the team, but I just love when he gets the ball. He's just such a threat. He's he's so elusive. Um, you know, with Jay- a bit of an Austin Healy vibe about him, isn't it? Where he just sort of work out where he put where he put him in with that kind of destructive like footwork and does things you just yeah, can't imagine. He he can play fullback. He's he's a winger, but you know you obviously you've got some pretty impressive wingers there who who've held the shirts down just before him. Um, but when he gets opportunities, he'll score tries. Uh, he's an exciting player. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think again you're probably looking at sort of those eight, nine, ten. That that the position James and Gibson Park's been sort of fantastic for Ireland. I'd like to see him keep that form. Uh, okay, we'll come to sort of final predictions uh, in a moment or two. Vive la France, Grand Slam champions in last year's Six Nations, and actually that game against England as well. One of the best atmospheres yeah. we've been in for a long, long time. Number two in the world currently. Fabian Galtier obviously leading things up with manager Rafael Ibanez. Sean Edwards uh, looking after defence, and Jerome Goss says is the in-house referee. So obviously discipline a big thing for the French right now. Dupont, obviously their skipper. Uh, beach Japan in the summer, which wasn't, I think, a great learning experience. And in November, Beach Japan beat South Africa and beat Australia. Can they do it again? I think this is a fantastic fr- French team. I think arguably you would say they you c- people will pick them as number one in the world, um, you know, and on and on merit as well. Uh, I think. They have the ability to play anyway, which is, uh, which has been rare for France over recent years. But what they've got with, Dupont, well, the pack that they've got, they can take you on physically. They can just dominate you. But then, obviously, with the talent that they have in that back line, they can air it out and they can win anyway. And and then with Dupont, they've got the mercurial, uh, and even you could even go that way with Entomac or or Jalibert, whoever they pick. So they have the the nuts about them. If you look at their depth, I mean, the depth of the forward pack, they you know, you go through the 10, 12 that you, you think could easily be starters. So they have three home games, but they have the two big teams away. They've got England away and they've got Ireland away. So can they do both of those? That, uh, you know, we've said they beat Ireland two years ago away, didn't they? Uh, which we always said was going to be a massive test of where they are. And then obviously that red card probably scuppered their, their, uh, their Grand Slam that year. Uh, so, yeah, I think they can go there. I think that's a huge battle for confidence going forward later, on, like what Geordie just said about Ireland. Um, I'm I'm really excited for I am actually really excited for this Six Nations. I think it's, you know, it, it could pan out to be a cracky. You've just got key games that have bigger repercussions than just Six Nations as well in terms of further down the line. Um, and I just hope the standard rugby is to the, to the level that we're all expecting. Fox, what do you see when you look at this French squad, their recent results, Sean in there as well? Are they still a side, I mean, much like Ireland, are they still a side on the up? Or does some of those results in November just begin to indicate, I mean, they were squeaky bum time against both South Africa and Australia at home. Yeah, I, th- I think they creaked a bit against South Africa. Um, but for me, it, it's, it's, they're my, Hang my on, we've, we've just applauded Ireland for squeaking out a 1916 win. Same question, though. Oh, fucking it? It, they, they've beaten by 30-26. Once you finish a full stop at the sentence, what you said before is disregarded <laughs> and then starts again. <laughs> so did, so you have to be, I'm not made accountable for what I said 10 minutes ago. That was <laughs> ended. That never happened. But now we move same on. question. They, I mean, the question was, they won a, they won a Grand time. Slam. They, well, no, they the... smashed Japan in Japan with a with third, a second, with a third, yeah. third team. And they won all three games in the autumn. Yeah. And the only but reason, the the, the only reason was, they're not number one in the world is because everyone else played four games. So, the, but the question to Jordan was, Ireland's November, does that indicate a, a side going up, staying the same or declining? And the question to John Fox was, are France going up, going the same or declining? I, I, I Like I said, I think they creaked a bit against South Africa, although they did Thank win. You. Please, please finish your sentence, um, Jonathan. But I think those, all those young core group that started three years ago or around um, uh, 2019, 2020, they've all gained so much more experience. And I think they'll look to repeat of what they did last year and going into a home World Cup. I think the the thing for me is whether they can handle the pressure, the expectance uh, they expect uh, in France. To, to so I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. And I think that's what Eddie Jones said when we did our thing with him the yeah. other day. He said that the it, the it, the France are the ones now. It's the next tournament is going to be absolutely fascinating as what's happening in September October, 
begins to get into the head. He said they're one dead leg away from not being a good side. Is really? basically what, what, what he said. What he Go said. On. He said Dupont goes down, then the, then the wheels come off. Now I'm not. I'm not saying that. I mean Dupont is unbelievable, <laughs> and, the, and the older he gets, the more he plays. I mean he's, he's aging pretty rapidly. Have you seen what he looked like before? That's what happens when you straight truck over top of people and and make massive tackles. But I think. It, it, the implication was that obviously it, he's such a key component. If you take him out, you know, do they have that same go forward, that same belief, that same sort of X factor? I think bizarrely, France are, are, are the converse of of what we say about Scotland um, and Italy. You know, they've always had superstars. Yeah. But it was the problem was trying to get all the superstars to play together, keep them the emotional, uh, you know, emotion together, and play for play in the right way. Actually, I think they've completely done that. I think you know the old belief system's gone out of the way. I think they can beat anyone. I think they're ruthless. I don't think they've got any madness in them. I just think you know red card and you said will, will dictate it. I think they're very very exciting, and I think the best thing about it is they're massive. Yeah, they're the athletes, size of the size. They've got skills. They've got offload. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think they're offer something different than Ireland, whereas Ireland, I feel, are slightly older, slightly more mature, slightly potentially slightly more ruthless. But but France, if you look at it on paper, they're, they're the side that you go, we want to see them absolutely tear up because they've got they've got the ability to unlock everything and do shit that no other side can do. And I always said I thought French players versus any other team in the world were probably the best players in the world. They just could never get the shit together to do it. I think now they are, and what they can do is 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 next level. I don't think they're good enough to beat both England and Ireland away. Because? Mentality. I know we they've worked a lot on it, but I just still think they'll face a very different England and Twickenham um, with that sort of preparation and that level of detail that sort of we know that England will put in. And that physicality, that will be a great game to watch. That's going to be uh, fireworks. I don't um, think it'll be a kicking fest. There'll be an element of kicking in it, yeah. I, th <laughs> I think I think there'll be a huge element of that, but I think there's beauty in that as well, Foxy. Yeah, it's like watching chess. Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you about the kicking thing, right? This is again something people talk about. At the moment, the sides that kick most in, in the world rugby win. Yeah. It's and that's been something like that, that people for a very long time. Yeah. People don't talk about New that. People go, you kick too with, much. Like, New Zealand with a key in that. They kick more than anyone, but no one thought they could ever kick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the point. That Eddie Jones always used to go on about it. And after the games, everyone used to level the criticism. And he was like, we didn't kick as much as the opposition. And the team that kicks more wins. I think I think that's because it's a defensively minded game at the minute. You know, I think the danger is all around attacking breakdowns in relation to, to yellow cards and contacts with heads at, at breakdown time. So it's actually if you're not getting really dominant carries and getting over the gain line, so you're getting quick ball, you're better off kicking it. And the stats are showing that. So if, if a defense can make a dominant tackle, you're better off not having it. You're better off playing territory. Um, that's kind of been very much part of the course for 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 a, a for, for a long time, you know. And and I think that's one of the things that you look at some of the teams who are playing fantastic rugby in New Zealand when they're going well. Even Leinster, you know, when they're playing well, they kick, but they kick at the right time. So they'll kick on edges. They've got the, the skill set to move the ball three, four passes, manipulate the backfield, and then put the ball in. And the more the ball bounces in in opposition territory and the opposition twenty two, the more likely you are to score points. So it, it's that's that's the, that's where the game's at. Until the the laws in around the breakdown, which don't get me started, that's another. <laughs> 20 minutes and are actually sorted out and, and referees and IRB start refereeing people being in can, control can of their body weight. Can you paraphrase what you want to see in th three points? The, the law for, for me on the break then says you must be in control of your body weight. So when you go to a jackal position, you have to be able to not put your hands past on the floor. Yeah. You have to be able to control your body weight. However, I look at every game, every weekend. Never and happens. People never do that, which makes it difficult because people are lying over their hands on the ground or hands on the ball. And then where can you clean that out? If Hask is over this table with his hands on the floor and I'm coming to a breakdown, how can I physically clean him out without hitting him in the head? It's impossible. I'm better off kicking it three phases ago so I don't have to go to that situation. His head or the ball? If you put Hask... If you the if you put Hask, the ball, they kick if, him in the if, head. If the ball is at the backside of that table yeah. and Hask bends over and he's on his That's feet... That's where you lost me. If Hask is controlling his body weight and he's on his feet, it gives me a target area to get underneath him. Yeah. If Hask's feet are back here at the sofa and he's long and his head is a foot off the floor beside the ball... There's no possible way that I can clean him out without hitting his head. Right. I always knew I liked Geordie. Yeah, also, the Be laws. best law, best law change. You've got to come back. You've got to stand over the over the tackle player before you can go for the ball. Do you, the, like the big step. Yep. Back in the days, the high tech yep. boots creates uh, creates Wait, three three, three, po three points of clearing out, and it'll take away all the head things. Pick us a Frenchman, and then we'll then then we'll do a uh, championship winner. Um, without saying Dupont. Without, without saying Dupont. Saying Dupont. Uh, Macaloo. He's a hell of an athlete. Mate, that's what I mean. 
I love Pinot, Jamonet, I love, but then I love watching Julien Marchand, uh, Jelange. So you just basically just go through the squad. You well, pick me a player that you're really... Because well, what people okay, will watch well, this I'll and listen pick, to I'll this. always pick a back then, and okay. I'll always pick Pinot, because I think he's here. Damien I think uh, he, uh, his skill set is just exceptional. I can't remember watching his dad play. That's depressing how old I am. Jordy? Gregory Fred? Aldred. Yes. I think he's a machine on on song hero. I love an on, on song hero and I just think he gets through so much work and I, I just love watching him play. John Fox. If he plays uh Moifana. Yes. Do you have you played against him? Yes. Like it's like tackling a ball of rubber bands type thing. You just you can't manage to pin him down. He's a bit of a block, yeah. <sighs> yeah. And um no, he, I think was he at Bordeaux? Bordeaux? Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, I think I played against Bordeaux. Yeah, I know he's a good player and I think he, I think he played on the wing a bit last year, but if if Dante's injured, he might get um, the foul. Shit. Versatile. Last one. Macklin. Love it. Unit. Lovely. The winner of the twenty twenty three Guinness Six Nations will be rugby. <laughs> uh, uh, I am going to go France. Are you? Yep. Ireland. Wales. Oh, for f- <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Are you rich? Do you back, genuinely Gallum believe that? Gallon might be watching. Wales online. Jonathan Davis, back Wales to beat everybody. <laughs> Pick me. Faith well, restored. Pick me, Gallon. <laughs> yeah. Well, I might say, uh, Wales online are going to do an article, aren't they? Um, no, I do think that, like... Davis slams average Gatlin. <laughs> <laughs> you are so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this now your new thing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a flat yeah. earther, I'm going to say that. Yeah, flat earther. Um... Uh, yeah, I do. I think with if it wasn't Wales, who would you then? The monarchy's run by lizards, says Davis. <laughs> in upset. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Ireland, obviously, are the ones to beat. Right. Um, and Wales will do just that. Wales game will one. do that on Sunday. First game. Yeah. Go on. I think France are going to win it. Do no, you? I don't actually. I think Ireland are going to win it. Actually, I think France. Ireland, France. Yeah. Ireland, Frylands. Ireland's aunts. I think Ireland. Of that. That's yeah. going to go really nicely on our predictions. And, uh, What's that? Said England earlier on. on. Yeah, I'm just, honestly, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> like, please. And if, if you're really impressed by what I said, that's what I meant. If I got it wrong, then it wasn't what I said. But if I got it right, that's exactly what I meant. Good. Take out of that what you will. Yeah. Um, help yourself to any predictions. Right, now we've got a new game to play in this year's Six Nations. Listen up, everybody. One that we'd love you to get involved with, Mystic Mike's Predictions. Ooh. Ooh. In partnership with our old friends, our dear friends and our good friends at City Index, (laughs) one of the leading providers of tax and commission-free spread betting across thousands of financial markets. Very nice to have them back on board for this year's Six Nations. Tins, drum roll, over to you. We've got Wales against... That's exciting. He's behind a cat and a dog. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) We had Bertie the predictor. (laughs) The octopus, (laughs) they had a cat. (laughs) Then Elmer's cat. Now we've got Tyndall. Right. Similar level. What's what's lower than a dog? A Tyndall, apparently. Uh, Tins, over to you. We've got Wales, Ireland, England, Scotland and Italy, France this weekend. Who is getting your backing and why? Um, I'm going to keep this quite quick. Uh, For the Wales versus Ireland, I have gone Ireland to win and I've gone for them to win by 12. Would you like to be doing this for real now or you've had to pick your picks earlier before we've managed to actually bounce it are you still comfortable uh, with Ireland by 12 in the yep. cauldron of Cardiff and the Gatland bounce back ability well, factor I'm not, I'm not happy about the fact that he's pulled out that they haven't beaten Wales in Wales in nine years <laughs> um, I'll be honest with you, you do I might have dropped the Mike. points a little bit uh, but uh, you know looking at if Ireland are to be considered properly and as number one in the world they should be going and do the job on Wales that's my belief okay. uh, England versus Scotland they've got England to win by eight uh, that's a bit more than what I actually started with I started by five but I've gone with eight um, but then saying <laughs> Scotland I'm actually going as what form should tell you because Scotland have won four out of five yeah and seem to have England's five in 50 at Twickenham though Scotland oh, yeah. have won yeah so, so that I'm, backs, backs I'm you up. Taking the fact that both is coming in, it's going to give them a bit more direction. I think there's going to be a bit more freedom in players. So I'm going with England by eight. Uh, and then Italy versus France. I've gone France to win by 18. I think I was I could have gone more than that, but I do. I'm hopeful that Italy will turn up that first game at home and try and lay down some markers. But France will just be too classy. Um, Two big away wins and England in the Calcutta Cup. Yeah. Uh, but if if everyone wants to join in, there is obviously a competition. Whether you agree with me or disagree, just be kind. I'm I'm a, I'm a nice guy, really. Um, some might disagree. Um, but if you if you do want to take part, head over to superbrew.com forward slash gbr and join in on the Superbrew 
app, superbrew.com forward slash GBR. Thank you very much to City Index. Good to have you on board for our Six Nations predictor game. Tins, I think it's fair to say, has gone bold in week one. That is it for this week's show for our Six Nations preview. Jordan, thank you very much. Are you going to the game in Cardiff this weekend? I am. You are working, watching, jacket padding? Hopefully watch, yeah, a little bit of a... Uh Corp socializing corporate very nice are you there or are you on the sofa with your calf up <laughs> i'll be there i'll be there trying <laughs> to uh he's off he's off abroad get, get some attention are you? Off, gats, uh, yeah, i'm here yeah. gats, how are you, you get a free holiday no, no, not like that he's trying to yeah. get a free holiday David's he's trying to find injury for cash <laughs> 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 we're all at twickenham are we um, yep, we're all we're all at yeah yes we are at twickenham excellent god it's it's going to be a ripper it is going to be a very very exciting few weeks it's the tournament that gets us through the tail end of winter and let's hope we're in for an absolute belter. Thank you for joining us once again. If you'd like more of the silly and less of the rugby, it says, head over to Apple Podcasts and sign up to listen to our extra pod, which is the lock-in just for those who want it. Don't worry too much about it. If you don't, merch on the website for the super fans as always and keep your eyes peeled for an episode of GSR this Thursday. Thank you very much indeed once again for joining. GBNR is produced by Shara Kilgallen and is a folding pocket production. Enjoy your rugby this weekend. Bye for now. <laughs>